I think I'll I think I'll go ahead and start and respecting everyone's time. And um, I may have to pause to, to admit people. Um, but thank you very much for joining us uh, for our webinar. We thought it would be uh, very appropriate to take a kind of a look in advance of the election and, and get a sense of what might be the possibilities next year under different scenarios. I mean, obviously we have different ways that the election could come out with regard to the legislature, which is the only thing we're thinking about here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it could be, it could uh, continue uh, under Republican control. It could uh, potentially shift the Democratic control or it could be split control. But in either case or any of those cases, the choices that we have before us are pretty much the same. So uh, I want to first thank you for joining our webinar. And um, I want to uh, introduce our speakers. I'm extremely pleased to have such a distinguished panel uh, to join us. Uh, we have Senator, um, sort of taking it from the upper left, we have Senator Van Dyne uh, from Buncombe. We have uh, Representative Craig Horn from Union. Uh, we have um, uh, Representative uh, Chaz Beasley from Mecklenburg. And we have Skip Stam, uh, who is of Wake and formerly represented Wake. Uh, I just want to give you their bios uh, very quickly. Um, Paul Stam, I think he's the most senior, so um, I'll, uh, I'll let I'll take him first, was first elected to the North Carolina House of Representatives in 1989, and he served eight terms in the legislature. He served as the House Republican leader uh, from 2007 to 2010, and as House Majority Leader uh, from 2011 to 2012, and Speaker Pro Tem uh, from 2013 to 2016. He then chose to retire from the House, and he's currently practicing law. Uh, he has long been an advocate of redistricting reform and serves on the board of North Carolinians for redistricting reform, uh, which is the bipartisan group that was spearheaded uh, by Judge Tom Ross uh, and, uh, and Representative Chuck McGrady. State Senator uh, Terry Van Dyne uh, represents Buncombe County. Make sure I'm, I think Jennifer's kindly still in, uh, letting people in. Um, state Senator Terry Van Dyne represents Buncombe County and the State Senate, um, to which she was first appointed in April of 2014. And she served as Minority Whip in 2015-16 and prior to becoming a legislature, she was a successful businesswoman working with multiple software companies and startups uh, and with some of the world's largest companies. And Senator Van Dyne has also been an advocate of redistricting and sponsored reform legislation in the current session. I say current because I figure it's not really dead until it's dead, which is not until <laughs> Possibly later than that. But anyway. mm -hmm, I see. Theoretically, they've adjourned, but I've, I've learned that that is not really a thing. So um, Representative Craig Horn uh, has been a member of the State House since 2011, uh, representing Union. And before becoming a legislator, he was a food broker, which sounds very interesting, as well as serving in the Air Force for seven years. His work in the legislature has really focused on K-12 education, which I, I, I feel is probably his real passion. But uh, we invited him to join us here because of his work on the, on the redistricting committee, where he co-sponsored two of the session's reform bills. Um, finally, a Representative Chaz Beasley represents Mecklenburg County in the State House, and he was first elected uh, to the House in 2016. Before joining the General Assembly, he served on the staff of the U.S. Senate Majority Leader and interned for judges on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and the North Carolina Supreme Court. So you might, as you might imagine he's a lawyer. He's also been an advocate for redistricting reform, serving as a lead sponsor for one bill in the House and co-sponsoring two others uh, in this session. And I want to note that uh, two of our panelists are Republicans and two of them are Democrats, and that none of them is on the ballot for next month's election. And as a result, uh, none of the three serving legislators will be in the legislature when it convenes in January, at least. Uh, but we hope that they will follow Skip Stam's example by staying involved in redistricting. So uh, I want to thank you very much, uh, you know, for joining us, as I said. Um, and. Um, I'm assuming nobody has any questions uh, about that. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to do pretty much a discussion. I'm going to make a very brief presentation on the two bills, or rather two uh, two pieces of reform legislation that were adopted in uh, in uh, one in New York and one in Virginia. Those being the only states, to my knowledge, that do not have citizen-initiated referendum. In other words, that that they did not have the ability for citizens to collect signatures and put something on the ballot. Um, and we do not have that either. As far as I know, those are the only two that have introduced a commission type of reform. There have been other reforms um, introduced. 
So my first question um, for everybody, and you can just kind of jump in, but we'll try to keep it even more or less, uh, is why do you think it has been so difficult to get redistricting reform through the legislature? Anybody? <laughs> well, um, I'll, I'll start uh, because um, politicians like to choose their voters. Uh, it's in their best interest. I um, first went to Raleigh with a dear friend of mine, Tom Colson. We were both members of Common Cause and we went to talk to my predecessor uh, and um, I'll, I'll never forget, he um, leaned back in his chair and he said, Terry, Democrats draw great districts. And um, I, it, so it's, it's hard not to want to put your finger on the scale. But what we've found over the years is that um, uh, because, well, for one thing, um, I like to remind voters who, who tell me that this is the way it's always been done that this is not our grandfather's redistricting anymore, that because we have supercomputers and because we have very sophistic sophisticated models and because those models have access to so much data, so much information about voters, that we can, um, we're so much better at drawing districts that crack and pack um, our voters uh, in a way that makes them feel like their votes don't count. Um, so uh, thank you for convening this meeting um, because I am, I've always been committed to independent um, districts. I think um, uh, I'm very hopeful we'll get there. Me too. Uh, this, this is Stan, if I could add something here. Please do. Uh, a uh, year ending in zero, like this year, is the best time to do it. Uh, not today, but because neither side really knows who will win the next time. And this is why we had serious efforts in 1989, uh, 2009, uh, and 10, 2020, we came close in 2020 because uh, that's when people are most uncertain about who will win and what the stakes are because a gerrymander does not last forever. People move, their uh, demographics change, their thinking changes so that a map that looks real good for them at the beginning of the cycle doesn't look so good four, six, eight years later. Yeah, definitely. I mean, people and the state is one of the fastest growing, I think, a lot of people moving in uh, different parts of, in, you know, parts of the state, for sure. Well, um, you asked, uh, why have we not? And it's, you can apply, the, the, the reason is that, that who's ever in office doesn't want to take the, they know how they got there. They don't want to change the rules uh, because they may not get there next time. Now, it's sort of like a professional athlete. They wear the same socks to, on every game. They, superstition, I guess, but fear of the unknown. So why don't we change the district? Well, I got elected based on this district. I don't know if I'll get reelected based on this, on a new district. Uh, uh, the old adage of the evil I know is better than the evil I don't know. But certainly, as Senator Van Dyne said, as, as uh, uh, Skip Stam said, uh, the, we're, this is a changing environment, uh, particularly North Carolina changing tremendously in volume and in, um, and in uh, the, the breadth of our, of our citizenry. And then technology is also changing. So can it be done? Yes. Why not? Well, because the evil I know is better than the evil I don't know. Uh, how do we overcome that? And that's the subject that we're all interested in. How do we overcome that? And it's, it's, of course, it's not easy. 
I, I love this phrase, lots of things are simple, but nothing's easy. It, and it's it, true here, it would not be that, it's not that hard to turn this thing into a very nonpartisan, non-emotional, data-driven decision. So, but remember, a computer will give you what you ask it for. So a lot depends on how you set up the parameters and at the end of the day, it's still people that make decisions and people don't always make good decisions. But we have seen states, we have seen states, um, California I think is a pretty good example that have um, uh, developed systems that are just full of citizen input and transparency and what they have seen is that they have seen more districts flip back and forth. So um, that means the districts are more competitive and probably more reflective of folks at the time of the election. Um, we've also seen in those states fewer um, lawsuits around the results of the redistricting. Um, and most exciting to me is we've seen voter turnout increase in those states. And I think what that says is if people think their votes count, they're more likely to get involved. And so um, I am very hopeful. Um, I think uh, Representative Stam makes an important point that um, in uh, elections that follow a census, um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the demographics are going to be like 10 years from now, and that creates um, an opportunity. But I think there's something very different from two 2020 um, compared to 2010. And that is in 2010, the um, legislature that was created in North Carolina um, was um, in part uh, certainly not in whole, um, but there was a significant investment made in that election um, by people who, who specifically wanted con to control the um, drawing of the maps. That was the Red State Project, which um, influenced legislative races across this country, but North Carolina was a target. In, in the 2020 election, um, it's a little bit different. Uh, what we're seeing is the, um, the, the organizations that are making investments in trying to change the way we draw districts are interested in independent redistricting. And so they are investing not in electors that will draw maps, they're investing in candidates that will, will um, have pledged to draw fair maps by giving that, um, uh, giving the ability uh, to draw those maps to an independent group. Yeah, thank you. We certainly, that's certainly what, what the league has advocated for many years and advocated under both Republicans and, and Democrats. Um, and uh, we, hope, uh, we hope that we will at least move in that direction. Um, and um, I don't know, Chaz, do you want to weigh in on, on yeah, sure. why it's hard and, and how we could even, how for we could sure. I, hope there is? For sure, yeah. I think that, um, you know, everything that's been said so far pretty much sums up. You think there are two other things that we have to keep in mind when it comes to drawing lines. Um, there's an old saying in gambling that every person always stays one hand too long. And that's the reason why they end up losing money. Um, it's the same thing in districts. People always think that they can hold the line if they're in the majority. Um, and that is something that both parties are guilty of. And so what tends to happen is um, they tend to think that they're going to stay in power, that their districts are going to hold, that their majorities are going to hold. And then when inevitably there's a wave, that wave um, tends to spread across a lot of unsuspecting districts. And then you have no longer the opportunity to draw lines for yourself. So I do think that's one important piece to remember that people just think they're going to keep winning. Um, it's hard to imagine that one day you're going to lose your majority. And so people don't want to somehow take money off the table 
because they're concerned that they may actually give the other party the opportunity to take the majority if they support independent redistricting. The other piece is, and I think we have to be very honest about this as politicians, um, all of us want to win and all of us would rather win easily than win hard. And so if there's a possibility that our districts are gonna get tough, then we tend to be more willing to stick with what we've got and let's make ourselves have the safest districts possible. When I ran in 2016, I was in one of those competitive districts. Every single day I had to wake up and work. Every single day I had to wake up and fight. That made me a better candidate and I hope it made me a better legislator as well. But unfortunately, most people don't want to be in a competitive race. They, they don't want to have to spend all the time raising all the money. They don't want to have to spend all the time doing all the things that it takes to win. And so I think those two things contribute mightily. And a lot of them are just human psychology. People want things to be easier. And they think the good times are always going to roll. And that, that makes it hard for people to, to do the right thing and pass independent redistricting. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people don't recognize that when you do have a gerrymander, because you are you know, separating out, uh, you know, the, let's say, for example, the Democrats are being pulled out of, uh, to, uh, to create Republican districts. At the same time, you are creating safer districts for those, uh, for people that are ending, ending up burning in those Democratic districts. So it creates uh, districts for, uh, safe, safer districts for both sides, more of the one who's in control, whether that's the Democrats or the Republicans, but safe seats for the legislators who are the ones, uh, as you say, who ultimately uh, well, who ultimately are going to be voting, although the leadership um, tends to <laughs> tends to have a lot of influence. Well, let's look um, quickly um, at a couple of states that have gotten something adopted through their uh, legislature. And as I say, as far as I know, in terms of states that, like North Carolina, cannot put something on the ballot by citizen initiative and you know with petitions, um, that these are the only two that that have gotten as far as they have. Uh, New York's was adopted in 2014 and ratified by the voters. It is a constitutional amendment, uh, as is Virginia's, and that um, they had to adopt it uh, in two subsequent, uh, two consecutive rather sessions, and they succeeded in doing that. Um, and, um, and consequently, it will be going before their voters um, in about a week. So let me see if I can um, open up the... Um, Making sure I get the right slides here. Okay. Um, I had some introductory slides there, which, you know, just in terms of introductions, which I figured I would let us all see each other. So I'm going to try to go through these quickly. Um, we're going to begin with New York, which actually adopted the reform first. Um, they started out with a, uh, with a system that, uh, you know, it's going to be um, uh, it's somewhat different from what, from what uh, North Carolina has, in that they did have a legislative task force specifically set up that drew the maps. And it was very much uh, what sometimes is called also a politician commission, um, in that there were uh, six members um, and at least four of them had to be legislators. And they were named by the people that are often called the Four Corners, uh, the leaders of each of the parties in the Senate and, and in the House and the Assembly. With, um, uh, but interestingly, not balanced. Uh, one of the principles that we feel is extremely important if you do have you know, a commission that is named uh, at least in part by the legislature or however it's chosen, you need to have party balance. And in this case, the majority party uh, got four seats um, to, the, uh, to the others, uh, the minority party only getting two. Um, and after the reform, they had a 10 member commission. And um, as, we'll off, as we often saw and as we, in a study that we did, we found it was almost always the case that the legislature has a role, and particularly the legislative leadership again, um, has a role in selecting the, the members. And each of the four legislative leaders um, picks two from their respective parties for a total of eight. And then those eight select two additional members who are neither Republicans nor Democrats. They would typically be unaffiliated, but they could also be minor parties. And in the case of the post-reform design as adopted um, uh, and ratified by the citizens, none of the 10 commissioners are legislators. And it also has a requirement of that to the extent practicable that the members must reflect the state's diversity. And of course, if you have a, a um, you know, a, 
a uh, committee that is predominantly legislators, it's much less likely to reflect the state's, the state's diversity. Uh, the, a number of things are barred from the commission, legislators and their staff, former legislators, statewide elected officials, and so forth, basically trying to keep off the commission um, anyone who really is a, uh, you know, a, an actively uh, engaged in, in politics as their, as their primary, um, uh, primary pursuit, or their spouses for that matter. The commission approves maps. Um, first, they have to select two co-chairs, one from each party, and then a supermajority of seven of the 10 commission members must approve a map, which means that you have to have at least some from, from each of the two parties. They also, this thing has been, this thing reads like a, like a prenuptial agreement or a divorce agreement or something. It's very carefully balanced to, to ensure that the minority party um, you know, has some degree of control as well as the majority party fearing, uh, as was mentioned, that as the, you know, as the, as the roulette wheel spins, that you could end up, uh, you can end up in either category. So if one party controls the assembly, then the map approval requires a yes vote of at least one commissioner appointed by each of the four assembly leaders. Um, so that means that you must have, you know, um, you must have 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 people from from uh, both parties. And if the commission cannot approve the maps, the two that have the most support within the commission are sent to the assembly. Well, then who approves the maps? Um, we, we typically, when we look at a plan, we ask the questions of who draws the maps, who approves the maps, and how are they drawn, with really the emphasis on who draws and who, and who approves rather than on the criteria which are in the, in the process, which, as Terry mentioned, are, are nonetheless very important, uh, but we feel that, you know, it's having that power of the pen that really, um, really turns the day. So the legislature has to vote on the commission's maps without amendment. But the way they vote depends on who controls the legislature. If different parties control each house, in other words, if you have split control, approval requires a simple majority. And um, if the commission could not agree on a map, then passage of, of one of the two top voted commission maps requires a 60% super majority. If one party controls both houses, however, approval requires a two thirds vote in each house, protecting to a great extent against one party dominance. And if the legislature rejects two maps in succession, it then can revise a commission map, but it has to follow the same rules that are set up for how the, how the map is drawn. So the, the main is that there are more opportunities for public input. There are 12 hearings across the state to ensure public input. Uh, the maps, data, and software have to be made available to the public so that the public can draw alternative lines. This is often included, although I have to say I'm, I'm, I haven't seen a case where that really was influential uh, except possibly, you know, here or there on that. But nonetheless, it does you know, encourage the public to become involved. And, and um, previously, there were no requirements for hearings um, and map or, maps or data to be provided to the public. It could be done entirely in secret. Uh, the Virginia reform has some similarities and also has a lot of differences. It's the first uh, real commission in the South. So we're, we're proud uh, you know, on their behalf. Uh, there are 16 commission members, eight legislators, and these are sitting legislators. Um, selected by uh, the legislative leaders. And then there are eight citizens who are chosen by a panel of retired judges, but they select those eight citizens from lists provided by each of the four principal leaders um, of the, on the Democratic and GOP side. Um, and um, there's still some details to be determined. Uh, we don't, for example, it's not specified much about what the party composition would be of those other citizens. Um, but, um, you know, but there, there has been some legislation and there will be probably additional implementing legislation that will be adopted. So who approves the maps? Uh, the maps must be approved by um, at least six of the eight legislators on the, on the commission, as well as six of the eight citizens. The legislature then gets only an up or down vote. They cannot amend. Again, there are two tries at it. If they don't approve one map, then the commission submits a second map. If the legislature fails to approve those maps, however, uh, a very strong uh, um, part of their, of their procedure is that the legislature cannot then amend one of those maps. Instead, their Supreme Court establishes the districts. So that part below just kind of lays out that procedure again, uh, so that the, the Supreme Court has the potential to become involved uh, in the event that they cannot approve a map um, and uh, really the commission, the commission draws, but does not approve the map. In California, the commission both draws and approves the map. 
So um, how are the maps drawn? Again, there's a lot of public input and transparency. Meetings are open before proposing any redistricting plan and before voting, they must hold at least three public hearings around Virginia and all records and documents, including external work products and internal and external communications are considered public information. So uh, the, the legislative success um, was achieved in Virginia through bipartisan support. Um, although uh, quite a bit changed between 2019 and 2020, Virginia is one of the very few states that, that has their legislative elections um, in the off years for whatever reason. Uh, they, and they, as I mentioned, they have, we don't have this requirement, thank goodness. They have to pass um, a constitutional amendment twice in succession with absolutely not a comma change between the two. Um, and the first time, the, uh, the, uh, uh, it passed with uh, very good um, uh, support and uh, quite bipartisan support, although there were some Democrats that voted no when they were in the minority. And in the Senate, uh, in the House side, on the Senate side, it was um, you know, almost unanimous. In 2020, the picture changed. This is when the Democrats took control of the legislature. And in 2020, reform passed again, uh, but much more narrowly, um, and it passed with predominantly Republican support in the House. Um, so that shows you how, you know, as uh, was mentioned, uh, if the roulette wheel turns against you, uh, they suddenly become a lot more interested in reform. Um, but, but there was support from the Republicans um, uh, in, in, in both years. So, so the bottom line was, they passed it, which is the critical thing. So that gives you an idea of the kinds of things that, that are out there and, and how the, the devil's in the details when it comes to redistricting reform. So let us, um, let us end this, stop sharing, um, and um, have a question sort of based on that. Um, we've seen that only two states have passed reform. Um, and so I'm interested in the sort of, I know I ran through these kind of quickly, um, but uh, you know, what do you guys think of these models? Are, do they have elements uh, that would be attractive or possibly acceptable in North Carolina? Uh, they give um, uh, the leadership quite a bit of control of commission member selection. And I would say that this is almost always the case um, in anything that's being put before the legislature. Uh, but at the same time, they limit the legislature's power to draw its own maps, which is the critical, to me, the critical concern. But do uh, any, uh, any who wants to um, who wants to go first uh, in terms of any thoughts on this kind of any elements of this that you think would be helpful in getting this adopted or maybe you don't like them <laughs> so um, feel free. Well, at first glance, I I tried to read through this a little bit and and get a, a good grip on it uh, ahead of time. Uh, I tend to lean more toward the New York example than I do the Virginia example, um, but I. I, as I said earlier, lots of things are simple, nothing's easy. And there's, there, it's important that, uh, that, uh, that whoever proceeds here in, in North Carolina should have, engage the folks in both Virginia and New York in a conversation, learn from them what to do, what not to do, and how to make the process more efficient. The, uh, but I, I gotta tell you, it's uh, legislature's a funny place uh, in many respects, of course. And the pressures are quite interesting that come along. And I'll give you an example of what happened in North Carolina. Uh, with this last run at uh, drawing the districts, uh, folks from each side of the aisle engaged in drawing each, all the, in drawing the districts. And after lots of hand wringing and back and forth, they actually all came to an agreement by and large. But when it came to a vote, it was a vote absolutely along party lines. Now, come on. If we've come to an agreement that this, is, this makes reasonable sense, it's not the best, it's not the worst, okay, I can live with this, and then we vote on the whole thing, and the vote is right along party lines. So right. who's pulling the strings and why? So it, it really, at the end of the day, it boils down to, a, to another old phrase that I've heard many times. If you wanna do something, any reason's good enough. If you don't wanna do something, any reason's good enough. So it's, that's what makes us so hard. 
when you take pieces and parts, you can agree on pieces and parts. The challenge is, can you agree on the whole? Because the sum is not always the total of the parts. Uh, but at the end of the day, I tend to like the, uh, the process they uh, have developed in New York more than I like the process that they developed in Virginia. I think it, uh, I think it has, stands a better chance of working or some, some form of that here in North Carolina. Oh, well, thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, and uh, we, th neither of these, of course, have actually been tried. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I think you know, they, they, they each have some, some advantages. But I think that New York is, it was the only model out there for someone to say in our situation. Um, now we do have a couple. And of course, the other, what the other states have done. I, I think it would be very hard to develop. A legislature has never voted for an independent commission that, that both drew and approved the maps uh, if there was not a very serious referendum staring them down, you know, down the pike. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I think we'll get something in this general area. That would be, that would be the most, I think, frankly, that we could get. But I would like to add one more, yep. more comment, yeah. if I could. Sure, please. And that is, uh, we are, we talk a lot about the rise of the unaffiliated voter the number of unaffiliated voters. Though they may register unaffiliated, but that doesn't mean they're unaffiliated. So I'm not real impressed with the numbers of unaffiliated voters to the extent that I don't necessarily believe that that shows that they have wrung their hands of both parties or either party. Frankly, I've wrung my hand of, bo of both parties. Uh, amazing to me, the nonsense and the but one of the things that's got to happen in order for this to work is we've got to stop using redistricting as a bludgeon. And that's what's happened. And, and that's happening particularly in, a, in this, the contentious political environment in which we now operate is it's become a bludgeon. And that's not how we're going to, how we're going to gain success. We've got to give people a reason to do things rather than a reason to not do things. Do you mean the uh, leadership using it as a bludgeon or uh, of either party in order to draw a, a safe or not so safe district? Or do you mean uh, as a political issue? It's a political issue. I think that redistricting has, has become a political issue and it's using, used by one party over another to just bludgeon them into the ground and point fingers. But and we're using everything to do that these days. And that's what, why we have unaffiliated, I think, it's not that we've foregone our beliefs in a fundamental system, whether it be a conservative system or a liberal system. It's because we're sick and tired of all of the, the crap that goes with elections. I sure am. This, this is Skip Stam. Can I weigh please. in on this question? Yeah, please. Uh, over almost 30 years, I introduced about six different um, redistricting reforms. And the first one I introduced was a second cousin to the New York model. But through the years, I've gone uh, very differently uh, into the one that was came close this year, House Bill 140, to thinking that it's not so much who uh, draws the districts, but rather what are the criteria. And therefore, what you want to do is to have the criteria so tight that um, um, mischief is very difficult to uh, rear its head. So let me just give three little examples. Uh, one of the criteria that a lot of people think is good, and I think is good, is that the map should not uh, favor incumbents by, the only way not to do that is really to not let the map maker know where the incumbent lives. Well, if you have 12 hearings uh, all around the state and you have a thousand people speak, uh, you will find out where the incumbents live, whether it's officially on the map or not. And many other th things that you will find out at public hearings are criteria that should not be considerations. Uh, for example, Senator Van Dyne mentioned all the uh, data uh, that we now have on voters. Well, the people speaking at those hearings will give you that data, all the data you need to do bad maps. Uh, another problem is that uh, in the Vir Virginia case, for example, there's a lot of role for judges, you know, picking names out of uh, lists 
or even drawing the maps if the parties can't agree. Well, that's not something that judges were ever elected to do, and they're not good at it. Uh, it's a separation of powers problem. Judges decide cases based on the law. They have no particular expertise in drawing lines. Now, that, that doesn't mean they can't do redistricting cases and say that a particular line uh, did or did not follow the Constitution. So, for example, uh, the 2011 racial gerrymanderings were struck down by the court, and it's not usually remembered that those maps were approved by Eric Holder and President Obama. And how could they have approved racial gerrymanders? Well, the law changed. The law changed. Well, how could anybody have known that? They couldn't. Uh, so that's a a second problem, then very briefly, this, uh, this unaffiliated voter getting a certain number of seats at the table, uh, I'll just remind you, uh, who, if, as, as Craig said, uh, uh, unaffiliated by registration has nothing to do with ideology. There's far right independents, far left independents, and just mostly disgruntled people that don't want to get a lot of mail. But uh, the current chair of the State Board of Election, the Democrat State Board of you know, you used to be the unaffiliated member chosen to be the chairman of the state board of elections. Uh, Sir Costa, I think is his name. In other words, it's a myth that you can pick uh, uncommitted, unaffiliated people who are also knowledgeable enough to do, actually do the job. So those are my, I have three thoughts a day. Well, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, well, we've heard from both of our, our, uh, our GOP uh, panelists. I, I'm not trying to be political, but just noticing that. Um, how about someone from the other side of the, of the ledger? You know, uh, we heard that over and over again in the legislature every time it came time to redraw districts because of a court decision. And um, the fact that it was just impossible to get the politics out of it. And that may be true in the extremes, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And I think um, uh, the bill that um, Representative Stam mentioned, um, H-140, did have um, not much, but some Republican support. Uh, and I am hopeful um, for a number of reasons, but um, I am hopeful that there will be a significant change in the legislature. One of the things that comes with new members, and I say that be this because of my experience after the last election, when we got seven new um, senators elected, um, is that uh, they have come from competitive districts um, they are not steeped in the um, disagreements that have happened in the past and the hurt feelings that have developed in the past. And they've worked hard to get elected and they want it to count. And by, by saying they want it to count, I mean, they want to do the right thing. And, um, and so I am hopeful I think it will take a change. Um, and I know you are not a partisan group, but um, I am a Democrat and I believe in my heart that it will take a change from Republican control to Democratic control since we do not have the ability to do a citizen referendum in order to get independent redistricting. And I think that um, there was an article in WRAL just this week where um, uh, House members, uh, particularly Representative Jackson, the House uh, Democratic leader, said that he is absolutely committed to it. Um, and I asked uh, my caucus this week, we are absolutely committed to it. Um, I can't swear to you, I won't be there, that they won't change their minds, but I feel fairly confident that we'll get at least as far as the bill that Representative Stam mentioned, H-140, which at least provides for, um, it, 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 it takes it out of 
um, the majority party's hand. And, um, you know, North Carolina has suffered, I believe, under extraordinarily extreme gerrymandered districts. And that has not served um, either party very well. Um, and so, you know, hope springs eternal. And, uh, and I'm very optimistic. If we, if we are successful at taking the majority, I think it will be job one. It's what the governor wants us to do and our leadership has so far expressed a commitment to do it. Yeah, we, uh, we can be hopeful, although there's some people who say that, well, maybe if it were split control, that would also be um, strong pressure because neither party would be able to control since, of course, both houses have to approve both maps um, and the congressional map. So I, that think that, also I think that's a fair point. I think that's a fair and excellent point. Um, okay, I don't know if any, uh, Chaz, if you have any particular remarks on, on this question, uh, you know, what yeah. you think of these. For sure. So I think there's one thing that we have to keep in mind when we're determining um, the answer to your question. Um, and that is in North Carolina, unlike a lot of states, one vote is all you need. One vote majority is all, all you need in each chamber to theoretically, we have 120 members of the House, 50 in the Senate. If you had a 25-25 Senate, with the LG as the tiebreaker and a 6159 house. You, because the governor has no role in redistricting under the constitution, cannot veto maps, could theoretically draw maps that are con completely stacked for your party. So unlike other states where the governor does have a role, that means that there is very strong incentive for a majority once they get that majority, to hold on to it for dear life and to do as much as they can to stack it. So to answer your question directly, I think that there are two changes that you have to have, and this particularly goes to what Skip was saying. When it comes to setting those ground rules, those ground rules have to be enshrined in the North Carolina Constitution, and the voters then can decide if they want those ground rules to be the ground rules for redistricting going forward, because we're going to go through this again in 2030, and 2040 and 2050, or theoretically within those 10 years, if there are changes that need to be made uh, to statute then. The other thing that we have to keep in mind, because we do have that rule where the governor can't veto, is that the second piece we have to have is basically no ability to sidestep the process. So some states have the ability where if the commission sends you ideas and the legislature throws up their hands and says, we can't come to a consensus, we can't do anything, then now the legislature can draw it themselves. We have to make sure we don't have that ability because in North Carolina, there's no way to have that backstop of a governor vetoing um, a bill. And so I think that when we're talking about these other ideas, that piece, the fact that you can have a very narrow legislature make very big sweeping changes to our maps, that's unlike any other state to my knowledge, is something we have to keep in mind when we're determining what independent redistricting looks like for North Carolina. Yeah, I mean, I think a real principle of anything that's done has to be that the, that the two parties, uh, as long as we have a two party system, you know, are on an equal footing. Um, and and that, that really is critical. And a, a challenge of getting the governor involved if someone were to think that was a good idea. And there was a piece of legislation, which I won't go into the details, that um, was not what the uh, you know the nonprofit uh, advocacy organizations were looking for, but it ended up with the governor having a role, um, and and that um, that totally that that is that is guaranteed to imbalance the process, uh, you know. So so but uh, but it is what what I have found somewhat surprising. I mean, I spent my career a uh, big chunk of it working on governance, but not in the United States. And I always thought we had rule of law, um, and. The question that I would have with regard to something that really relied a lot on criteria um, is, is the question of whether they would actually be followed. Um, and the, the sort of, you know, the factual basis that I would, uh, I would mention is, is in fact um, the, the fact that the legislature approved uh, maps that were found to be unconstitutional racial gerrymanders 
um, on more than one occasion, even though that has been, you know, has been uh, by by court decision has been unconstitutional, which is, um, you know, for, for a number of years since 87. And of course, it was a North Carolina case that made it be, be declared unconstitutional. Um, but um, so if they'll violate the Constitution, I don't see what there's there's this is but the, to me, frankly, kind of a shock. And I don't think this could be included in a reform. If legislators violate the law in the course of the, you know, their their official duties, um, there's not much you can do about it. Um, you can vote them out in theory, but not if they're in a safe district. Um, so that's that's the challenge um, that I that I see with them relying too much on rules rather than who has the who has the pen. Um, but um, I think we have about ten minutes, so perhaps we should uh, let our 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 patient audience pose some questions. And then give folks a, a little bit of time to for any final statements they want to make. Um, and uh, raise your hand or something I've done, and that you do that by down at the bottom there under the under reactions. You can you can use that. Or I confess I've not been monitoring the chat. There are some chat things. Perhaps I should look there for questions. Um, someone asks uh, Lois asks uh, they're saying that there are unaffiliated uh, registered voters, lots of them. Uh, more than there are Republicans and quite likely soon more than there are Democrats. Um, how are they included um, in the map drawing process? Um, what I will say is that because of big data, um, because there is so much information that is available about you, um, that even though we may not know how you are, whether you lean Republican or Democrat, we can tell from other data and model fairly closely your propensity to vote. So what I am saying is that we don't, we used to look at voter registration data, um, but now we have so much more data. And so um, uh, uh, how you are registered uh, is, is by far not the only factor. Yeah, that's been the big change. There's so much data out there on, on everyone, what you buy, where you go to church, you know, education, income, uh, groups you belong to. Um, it's, it's very difficult. Theoretically, you can bar the use of that data and, and require only the use of the census data, but it's very hard to, present, to prevent parallel processes happening out there you know, in offices around Raleigh. Um, anyone else have some thoughts on, on how to ensure that the unaffiliated are engaged? Well, not hearing any. Does anyone else? Um, I, that was the only question I saw. Well, um, to make sure they're engaged in the process, of course, um, it, you know, in, in uh, I think a, a number of the bills that were proposed um, and I think Chaz, yours included uh, seats for unaffiliated people. Am I getting that? Am I remembering that wrong? So you know, we, we, there are actually three pools of voters. And, you know, Representative Stam makes the point that uh, maybe they aren't purely independent, but I think it's at least an attempt to, uh, to give those folks voice because they aren't you know, a lot of times they may lean um, one way or the other, but not completely. And they have a different perspective frequently. And um, it's a valuable one to bring into the conversation. Um, could I, this is, this I, is I mean, Sorry. I'm just sort of new to, to you, your group, but I am unaffiliated. And I will say, I, I was sort of taken aback when you said you thought people you know, they still lean and for some reason they registered unaffiliated to sort of be the hen and, you know, the fox in the hen house. Um, and that's not true. I've been a Democrat and I've been a Republican. In fact, I was a precinct worker in one of those parties for a long time. And um, I've seen Democrats be really underhanded and really got sick of it. And I've seen Republicans be just as bad. And uh, one of the things I've come into is working, uh, not working with, but really following the American Academy of Arts and Science uh, in their, um, what is it, Our Common Purpose is their two-year study on improving American democracy. And these are really uh, research-oriented people. And 
Um, they tend to think we can get more people involved in voting and be more participatory um, by having candidates that are more toward the center. And it seems to me that carefully redistricted lines where people do have a chance to make their vote count will encourage people to vote because they think they can make a difference. And it will also force the candidate to stop being so far left or far right because they're gonna to have to have enough votes from both sides of that fence in order to make a true uh, run on an office. And I, I don't know how much any of you are aware of that particular um, two-year project, but it was by partisan and um, <laughs> was interesting. David Brooks said one night when I was watching one of their webinars, you know, the left wasn't really happy with some and the right wasn't really happy with some, but we all agreed if we did these 32, I think it is, recommendations, we'd all be better off. So, you know, I, I just want to say I, I'm, I'm for people taking their name off the roll when they don't agree with it and stand in the middle and say, convince me that you really want that office for more than to line your pocket and to get a nice um, little pat on the back. Anyway, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an important well point. Yeah, go ahead, Terry. No, that, that, that's all I wanted to say. Well said. And I think to a certain extent, we've seen that in California. Like I said, one of the most, um, one of the things that impressed me most about what they do uh, is that it increased voter turnout. Yes. And, and it's you've got exactly to have it. what you said, because people thought their votes count. And isn't that what this should all be about? So thank you. What you said is, is, is right on target. Yeah. And, and as Terry said, there, um, you know, there, there, there was, there was uh, also more satisfaction with the legislature. Um, and that was because the citizens felt they had a greater voice. There were a greater number or a greater share of, of uh, competitive districts in California after the redraw. There are some districts, I live in Chapel Hill, there's no way you could draw you know, a district uh, you know, for Chapel Hill that was not gonna be a Dem district. And there are parts of, particularly in the west of the state, where you're gonna have a Republican district no matter what you do. Um, and it, it, but, that, but there are a lot of districts in the middle that fairly drawn would probably be competitive. Um, and and that, that is a factor because the voters, when they see that there's you know, nobody running or, or uh, you know, in many cases, or they're, they're, they're really turned off and, and, and having those, those, those legislators who have to compete for the middle voters also tends to, you know, to avoid that polarization that we've seen um, in part, not entirely, but in part caused by gerrymandering. Yes, and Jean, that was another point you made that when we're in such safe districts, um, then the primary becomes the election. And that moves us to extremes, okay. and um, and that makes it more difficult for us to compromise. There was a quote recently. I was listening to, um, uh, oh my gosh, now I can't think of his name. The former prime minister, uh, um, and he said that the the function or the process of democracy is elections, but the spirit of democracy is compromise. And we have lost that spirit. And I think that's tragic. I don't know whether gerrymandering could, could heal it, but it could certainly be a step in that direction. Well, we're very close to the end of our, of our time. And I want to give each of the speakers a chance um, you know, to make some closing remarks. Ms. Skip Stam, I'll take 30 seconds. I hope in uh, 2021, whoever's there will pass an early constitutional amendment. I agree with Representative Beasley. That's the only way to make it effective. Set a special election for about next March uh, before you then do this year's uh, uh, redistricting. Really? Yep. Well, I, I totally defer to you in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms. I hadn't heard of that, but that's that would be great. I got to say, hope you will help us do that. Well, I, and, and I agree with that as well. I've, uh, just so you know, I too have been both a, a member of both parties and an active member of both parties. 
Um, so I've got a, I've, I've felt the same thing that Gene Tillman has, and, and I've become disgusted with both parties, quite frankly. Uh, but I still have my, my fundamental beliefs in how government should work and the role of government. Those beliefs haven't changed a bit. In my opinion, it's the parties that have changed, not, not me. Hmm. Of course, that won't be the, um, the, how my, my remarks will be characterized, but that's okay. That's the way it is. Uh, the end of the day, it's the educated voter that is our best voter. The problem is we created a participatory system and then we walked away and didn't participate. And when I say we, we, the American people, uh, obviously we've got however many people are on this call, 36 people here that are partic participators. Great. We need to ensure that that's being done on a fair and balanced basis, which frankly, it's not. Um, we need people that are going to stand up and say, follow me, rather than people are going to stand up to, so they can throw a rock at the other guy. The reason that we have all these, this negative campaigning is because it works. And when it stops working, negative campaigning will stop. But uh, I've seen the worst of, of uh, political uh, partisanship in, in elections. Uh, I was active in Baltimore, Maryland. Do a little history, uh, read a little history about Baltimore, Maryland and the plug uglies. And you'll find, <laughs> find when it comes to corruption, you don't get much greater than than Baltimore, Maryland. But nevertheless, we, we, can, we can do this. I'm, I, I am not at all one to, to give up the ship. We can do this. I think that what Skip and Chaz had to say makes lots of sense. I don't believe it takes a, needs or, or a, a change of parties or anything else uh, for individuals or for the legislature to do this. Because frankly, they both are full of crap. They both tell you the same thing. And they both promise you the same thing. We've got to get out there and frankly, start asking our, our candidates harder questions. Start getting involved in not just the campaign part, but the, but the legislating part. I can tell you in 10 years in office, how many letters or phone calls I've received communication that wasn't beating me over the head for something which I could do that and, and not use all my fingers. That's just ridiculous. How many emails I get that start off with curse words, the first four or five letters, words in an email or curse words, and then demanding that I support their position. Yeah, how's that work for you? So when, when, when we finally learn how to talk to each other instead of at each other, we can do this. And every, every election, I'm hopeful, okay, this is the last, hopefully this is the last election with this nonsense. And then we turn around and make it worse. Huh? I, am, I refuse to be pessimistic. Uh, you've got a leader like Skip Stam with incredible history and an incredible memory of, of history uh, that can help see these things more clearly than, than a guy like me. So... I, I will do the best I can. I will work for this stuff. But the, first, we got to start educating and motivating the voter. And they go together, educating and motivating. Educating doesn't mean shoving your dogma down my throat. Well, that's definitely, that is, that is absolutely music to the ears of anyone in the league. We spend a lot of time trying to educate voters and, and try, to, try to do it in a, in a strictly nonpartisan fashion. And I think that does inspire more confidence. And there are two sides to every story. Um, you know, uh, Terry or, or uh, Taz, do you want to say something about wrap-up remarks of some sort? <laughs> what do you think we should do? Uh, sure, I'll j jump in. And um, uh, number one, I just want to say that it's great that you all are um, making sure that you're bringing attention to this issue because I think it's very important. Number two, I absolutely love it when Craig's in rare form. Um, I could watch that all day. Um, but I think the thing to remember is this is one of those situations where it's going to take political bravery for people to do the right thing and actually the thing that's in people's best political interest in the long term. You know, I, my background is in economics and it kind of has seeped into my brain. And I know that one of the things we say in economics is that in the long run, we're all gone. 
But I think at this in this situation, what we're talking about is a situation where basically every single party has put themselves in a box where they have to hope that they have a chance 10 years from now to be able to draw lines that will maximize their chances 10 years from now. So we're going to have to have people that are going to have to understand, look, North Carolina is a purple state. North Carolina is a state that is growing. It's 50-50. You got to get out there and work for a win. And the fact of the matter is there's nothing certain in North Carolina. North Carolina swings too much, and there's too many people that are trying to do the right thing and vote in good people. But they need to be given that opportunity. So we need people to go out on a limb, do the right thing, and to do it in a way that prevents any kind of shenanigans in the future. Well, that's, and, that sounds good. Yeah, and I just want to thank you for um, bringing us together and for all the work that the League of Women Voters has done for decades um, to inform voters, to bring candidates together. Um, the work you did with the lawsuit um, has made us a stronger state. So thank you, um, and uh, I think what you heard today is that yes, we can do this, but it's not going to be easy. So um, you know, stay the course. Well, thank you, and I and I, I, that's a very good note to end on. And I, I I'm am encouraged, especially if we can get people from both sides of the aisle to to you know to weigh in on this. Um, and I, I really hope I really want to thank. Um, all four of our speakers. I think it's been a good conversation and I've learned a lot and I hope that our participants have, well, as, have as well. Um, and we are recording and we will make this recording available on, on the Fair District's YouTube site and on other, other league sites. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And I will now uh, bid you all a very pleasant evening. And if you haven't voted, get out there and vote. <laughs> get your friends to vote.